somebody who would still write on clay tablets if you could get good clay these days. I'm overwired, but we'll make that work. It is time that theosophy should enter the arena. What is a life worth living? This is the great challenge for each human being today and is directly relevant to our three hot topics, religious intolerance, end-of-life issues, and depression. Religious intolerance manifests on a spectrum from shunning and denigrating those whose religious convictions and actions vary from one's own, to outright violence, suppression of others, and even their destruction is all too present in our complex and chaotic world. Those of a secular bent who reject all religions can easily fall on this spectrum. Sigmund Freud's belief that religion is an illusion, a neurotic condition to be banished in a mature, healthy individual is simply wrong. There is no religion higher than truth does not attack religions, but points beyond them to their source, which is theosophia. Truth is not attained by one approach, such as the so-called scientific method, or by one discrete form of meditation, or by one approach to the sacred and divine. Truth is spiritual and has many reflections, all of which are partial, and none of which is a perfect mirror. Hence the distinction between absolute and relative truth. And for an evolving human being, absolute truth, paramartha satya, is a goal, not an accomplishment to be set on a shelf with other awards. The view that one has the truth in its ultimate form is the foundation of religious intolerance. End-of-life issues are fundamental issues. For karma and reincarnation teach us that there is a very real sense in which life is a preparation for death. As Socrates says in Plato's Phaedo. Although a life worth living should prepare us for death, it should also give meaning to every moment in life. Even though we may find it difficult to grasp the meaning of every day, much less at every moment. Depression arises out of the inability to discern meaning events. For many, the events in their own lives, and for some, the events in the world at large. There is much in the world that invites depression and despair. So individuals ultimately must rely on inner strength when encountering the world. But the question, what is a life worth living, is hardly new. It has been the great challenge for individuals from the dawn of thinking. So we find this question in Pythagoras, Socrates, and Plato, in the Hellenistic Stoics and Epicureans, but even earlier in the Upanishads, Hindu schools, and Buddhist texts. And we find it in the earliest Taoist teachings, in Confucian thought, and in Jewish and Christian history. One may readily recall Boethius, Nicholas of Cusa, Meister Eckhart, and Jakob Burma, among many, many others. It is present in the Persi Persian Sufi mysticism of Surawardi, and in the Andalusian philosopher Mujahideen Ibn al-Arabi, and in the Quran itself. Clearly, the question of a life worth living has been a deep human concern for as long as we can trace human thought. But conditions change, and in human evolution, the question is ever new. The challenges of life today in a world that is both increasingly fractured and increasingly globalized only add intensity to the question, what is a life worth living? 
It will help us to approach our crucial hot topics from a perspective that starts with universals and moves to particulars, as Herman just showed us. Last year, the International Theosophical Conferences met in Philadelphia. It was concerned with practical ways to nurture a nucleus of universal brotherhood, the first object of all theosophical organizations. Among the many valuable and useful ideas and suggestions that emerged from presentations and working groups, two are especially relevant to this conference. The first centered on how to make theosophy practical and readily shareable with people, especially those without a background in the teachings. The second wrestled with the fundamental meanings of the one life. Both these concerns are relevant to the three hot topics of this conference. The one life is the foundation for the creation of a nucleus of universal brotherhood, but it underpins the whole of evolving humanity, no matter how few recognize or acknowledge it. These facts have two direct and immediate implications. First, the nucleus exists not just for itself, but to reach out to all humanity. It is integral to the bodhisattva ideal, and so to the master's work in the world. The nucleus of universal brotherhood, insofar as it really exists, reflects that ideal and that work. Secondly, this nucleus involves deep, profound, and ongoing individual transformation. For those of us who have the great good fortune of encountering theosophy, the challenges we invariably face are karmic opportunities to realize that nucleus and to make theosophy practical. In this conference, we will focus on our three hot topics, religious intolerance, end of life issues, and depression, because the world cries out for practical solutions. As the great master said, and I quote, the true religion and philosophy offer the solution to every problem. It is our task to nurture those solutions in those whom we encounter in this world rife with distraction, chaos, confusion, and suffering. All problems are ultimately rooted in what the great master named as the great dual principles, right and wrong, good and evil, liberty and despotism, pain and pleasure, egotism and altruism, and our hot topics involve them all. At a superficial level, these three topics have easily discernible causes. Religious intolerance occurs when individuals believe that they know and others are simply wrong and being stubbornly wrong, and are deserving a condemnation, even eradication. But why does an individual come to this conviction? The reasons vary from fear to delusion, and we have a sense, and we have to have a sense of the mental and spiritual environment surrounding that individual to know how to address intolerance. Depression arises from a sense and even a conviction that life, especially one's own life, is utterly meaningless and without purpose. Even the world can be seen as meaningless and without purpose. Physicist Steven Weinberg once famously said, the more the universe seems comprehensible, the more it also seems pointless. A view that hardly draws science closer to theosophia. Fortunately, many other physicists disagree. Again, we have to discern the basis for the depression, which might be intellectual, but often comes out of a belief that one is a victim of a heartless world, or that no one understands, or that no one cares, or all of these and more. End of life issues arise from various combinations of fear of death, fear of dying, the belief that death is somehow the complete end of oneself and experience and denial of death is a crucial part of life. We live in a world, especially the medically sophisticated and technologically modern world, 
in which there is a tendency to find a medication for every kind of suffering, including psychological suffering. It is not surprising, then, that the prospect of aging with its degradation of faculties and possible pain might as well be avoided by hastening death through some artificial action. Or a view of the finality of death may lead to attempts to prolong life no matter what, which is the flip side of inducing death. Medical practice can do either in many cases. One detects the atavistic pull of Atlantis here. But as already suggested, these explanations of our hot topics only skim the surface of, of the soul dynamics behind them. Human souls have complex histories which weave a karmic fabric that requires great insight even to begin to understand. H.P. Vivatsky willingly served despite illness and calumny under direction of those wise beings who tirelessly labeled to ben benefit humanity. She was the channel that brought theosophy in its modern form into the world for the sake of humanity. These mysterious beings do not interfere in the karma of individuals or of collective bodies, such as nations and cultures. Rather, they nurture the evolution of human beings and indeed all of nature in myriad ways. But theosophy, as they offered it through HPB in the last quarter of the 19th century, does not aim to produce occultists who gain new psychic powers, though such powers are quite real, but to provide the basis for the transformation of humanity, including self-transformation. We all have vast powers already. Powers of speech, thought, will, intention, and action. And as we know only too well, these immense powers can be used for evil as well as good. Theosophical teachings rooted in the doctrine of the one life and the twin doctrines of karma and reincarnation aim to help human beings in the transformation that includes harnessing these powers for the good of all. And we know from experience <coughs> that the ego rapaciously attempts to expropriate every spiritual thought and intention for its own self-aggrandizement. Getting past that ego to a sense of one's true self is not easy or without much continuous effort. The voice of the silence shows clearly the theosophist comes to a point where he or she must choose a path a fork in the road of life. One branch leads to benefits only for oneself, the other for endless service to humanity, which includes oneself. The great master says that the first path is, quote, after all, only an exalted and glorious selfishness. The second path is, he says, the self-sacrificing pursuit of the best means to lead on the right path our neighbor to cause to benefit by it as many of our fellow, fellow creatures as we possibly can. And it is this path which constitutes the true theosophist. The work of this conference aligns with the path of service. The true theosophist chooses this path, which is marked by the seven virtues enumerated in the voice. Only to the degree that we tread that path, which is ourselves, can we transform ourselves in increasingly fundamental ways. Each of us is that path, and fortunately, we do not have to be masters of the path before we can be of genuine help. The masters insist on direction, not perfection. The path has practical implications for each of us every day, indeed, every hour and minute. So we know that the life worth living is a life of challenge and opportunity. The situations we find ourselves in vary from individual to individual, rather like fingerprints. The people we encounter, the work we do, the relationship karma provides and takes away, our own dispositions, 
are all dynamic and change from moment to moment. Yet the challenge of a life worth living remains constant. It is our destiny to be challenged and to be afforded ever new opportunities to serve humanity. In terms of our hot topics, religious intolerance, end of life issues, and depression, we have the great good fortune of theosophical guidance and models we can look to today. The present Dalai Lama has made several radical moves in respect to religious intolerance. While remaining firmly in the Galugpa traditions of Tibetan Buddhism, he has opened that spiritual path to meditation of meditation and study to active engagement in and with the modern world. It is as if the tragic karma of Tibet is resulting in a painful birth. All births are painful. Resulting in the spread of Tibet's spiritual insights throughout the world. He teaches that his religious tradition is not the exclusive holder of truth and not the best path for everyone. <coughs> we believe that different religions can be equally valuable to respond to someone who says that only their religion is true. Now, I think we have to think about the uh, sort of two concepts, concept of several religion, several truth, and the concept of one truth, one religion. Uh, now, how to overcome using that contradictory contradiction? Uh, how to reconcile the two? Mm -hmm. I think, uh, like medicine, you see, according different illness, you need different medicine. So you cannot say this medicine, no matter according what illness, but this medicine is best. This medicine is only that. The only medicine. The only medicine. You cannot say that. To some people, the God, concept of God, is so powerful, so forceful, in order to be a more compassionate person and practice of tolerance. So to some people, that faith, that religion is much more suitable. And for that person, that religion is best because most effective. To such person, Buddhism is not, sorry, not good uh, because not talking about creator like that. So this, similarly, some other people who may, uh, according the uh, due to mental disposition, is a Buddhist way of approach, law of causality is more effective. So like that. So that's, I think, the basis, you see, to, to reconcile. Uh, reconcile. No. Mainly, I think, in the terms of individual, then the concept of one truth, one religion is relevant. In the terms of the community, in terms of several people, then the particularly now like that, like today's, today's world, world. Uh, it's a multi, it's a religion, yes. multi-culture. In that case, the several truth, several religion is relevant. I always emphasize the, the effectiveness or purpose of this different philosophy. Then we will find uh, the, the, the same sort of or the effect or oh. same result. I think in a uh, I said, a good restaurant, we usually, you see, we prefer variety of food. Just one sort of one kind of food, always, even if you see breakfast, same, lunchtime, same, uh, dinners, same. I think customer will reduce, less and less come. So variety of, variety of food is better, even the necessity for this physical. But then, this is a sophisticated mind, emotion. We need a lot of varieties. I think that's much better. Like that. Pretty radical for a representative of a particular religious tradition. An unwavering, unwavering representative. 
First step in eliminating religious intolerance is this recognition. All sincere seekers have insights. And none, short of total enlightenment, has the whole truth. The challenge to us as theosophists is to draw on the truths of all religions to discern their pristine origins in the wisdom religion. We can use that understanding to engage others, not in debate, but in dialogue that looks deeper into each one's own religion and to look beyond distorting reflections <coughs> to more fundamental truths. Notice the criterion the Dalai Lama gives to religion. It must lead the devotee to increasingly compassionate action. With individuals we encounter, like doctors, we must know something of their convictions and concerns to compound effective theosophical medicine to offer them. The medicine will be theosophy, but what is compounded must vary with the patient. The travel and culture, cultural author Pico Iyer once asked the Dalai Lama how one can change the hearts and minds of dedicated Chinese communists who are oppressing Tibet. The Dalai Lama answered, through one Chinese communist at a time. What we do in each encounter with another matters at that moment and also for the future of humanity. Personal suffering is not the necessary and sufficient condition for depression. This has been shown repeatedly by the survivors of tragedies who flourish even after passing through horrors most of us have not known. Depression is rooted in the twin conviction that one's life is somehow meaningless, pointless, without purpose, and that life in general and even the universe are equally meaningless and pointless. Here the theosophical teacher Raghavan Iyer offers a model for overcoming depression in oneself and <coughs> uh, in others who despair. He gently but firmly urges one to take stock of oneself as dispassionately as one can, meditating on the fact that we are reality assigning beings, which means both discerning value in karma and whatever it brings, and recognizing that we give value to or withhold value from things, events, and actions. Understanding our motives and the consequences of our thought and action enables us to correct what can be improved. It also leads naturally to sympathy and compassion for the struggles of others and for replacing judgmentalism with non-interfering assistance. To the degree we rectify in ourselves our orientation to Theosophia, we rectify our orientation in respect to others. Raghavan Iyer drew attention to Dr. Viktor Frankl as an example of someone who recognizes the centrality of the moral and psychological environment in which people struggle today. Frankl, in his metaphor of air flight, cuts to the heart of how we can be of assistance to others. They wish to make a lot of money. In Europe, every American student if more every American adult is regarded as someone who is just out to make a lot of money. Really, 16%, 16% of these students regarded their main goal and concern in life to make a lot of money. I'm quoting literally, make a lot of money. And you know what the top class, the top category, we say category, category, what do you say? category was among, you excuse me, but uh, I know I am speaking a marvelous accent without the slightest English. Now, <laughs> you know, you know what the top category was? 78% of these American youngsters were concerned as they expressed it themselves with finding a meaning and purpose in their lives. 
So this is realistic, a realistic view on man. And you know, you won't believe it. Gray, uh, gray hair, my age, I started taking flying lessons recently. Do you know what my flying instructor told me? If you are starting here, wish to get here, say east, heading for this, and you have a crosswind, you will drift and you will land here, so you have to do what we pilots call a crabbing, he told me, C-R-A-B, crabbing. You have to head for north of this uh, air, airfield, and you have to fly that way, you see, as if you headed in this direction. If you are heading here above this airfield, then you will actually land here. But if you head for here, you are landing here. This holds also for man, I would say. If we, if we take man as he really is, we make him worse. But if we overestimate him, It's premature, your applause, you will soon know why. If we, if we seem to be idealists and are overestimating, overrating man, and looking at him that high, here above, you know what happens? We promote him to what he really can be. So we have to be idealists in a way, because then we wind up as the true, the real realist. And you know who has said this? If we take man as he is, we make him worse. But if we take man as he should be, we make him capable of becoming what he can be. This was not my flight instructor. This was not me. This was Goethe. He said this verbally. And now you will understand why I, in one of my writings, once said, this is the most apt maxim and motto for any psychotherapeutic activity. So if you don't recognize a young man's will to meaning, man's search for meaning, you make him worse, you make him dull, you make him frustrated, you still add and contribute to his frustration. While if you presuppose in this man, if in this so-called criminal or juvenile delinquent or drug abuse and so forth, there must be a a, what we call spark, yeah? a spark of search for meaning. Let's recognize this, let's presuppose it, and then you will elicit it from him, and you will make him become what he in principle is capable of becoming. A Jewish doctor who went through the Holocaust in the concentration camps, and he learned these lessons treating patients, many of course who perished, and he discovered that many entered and unfortunately left hopeless. But some did not, despite those horrifying conditions. And it was on that that he developed everything that he subsequently called logotherapy, uh, one little piece of which we just saw. As theosophists, we should be in the position of acknowledging, in the words of Krishna in the Bhagavad Gita, the divine in every human being. In speaking to the Krishna within, we appeal to the best in another being. Given the inscrutable mathematics of karma, we will likely not know the results of such encounters. But we may have opened a vista on meaning and purpose that may manifest sometime in the future of that being, perhaps even in a future life, as Herman reminded us earlier today. Just as we should not overestimate what we can do for another human being, we should not underestimate it. In Frankel's terms, this is the idealism that is realism, as his example of airplane, airplane flight showed. Socrates and Plato provide a broad perspective for end-of-life issues. Socrates held, like theosophy, that all life is a preparation for death. And Plato showed in the myth of Ur not only why this is so, but also 
why such preparation is at the same time a preparation for the next life. The story of Ur, the story that Ur tells at the end of Plato's Republic is a myth. And Plato warns us that we should not take it literally. Yet a close reading of the myth of Ur is quite illuminating. Those who lived life without a focus on the soul, what we would call the higher self, are confused after death and wonder about lost and aimless. Those who had such a focus move directly into the processes that lead to the next life. The good are rewarded with the pleasant afterlife of a long time. We might think of Devahan. Those who were evil suffer in proportion to their deeds. We might think of the disintegration of the Kama Rupa. What is most important is that after this period, individuals' souls choose the next life. There are three significant points worth considering in this myth. The myth says that those who were so pure that in, that in their last lives, so were so pure in their last lives, that they would not benefit from another life, are taken away to some unspecified place of endless peace and bliss. Secondly, some very few have been so evil that no amount of suffering for their deeds and no range of opportunities in another life would afford them any chance at, re at redemption. These few are called out and disappear from the rebirth process forever. Plato draws extended attention to this tragic group as if we were issuing a dire warning he seems to be referring to that rare and horrifying annihilation that HPB speaks of only with great care. But he speaks of those pure souls who transcend the cycle of rebirth in a single phrase in the original Greek, as if reticent in the presence of such deep spiritual mysteries. Some translations of the myth have missed it entirely, so subtle is the reference. The third point is that, in the myth, when souls have the chance to choose their next lives, Plato observes that they do so in reaction to their past life and its consequences. Those who lived good lives often choose lives of power and drama, not noticing the dire results of such lives, though they are plainly pictured. Those who suffered the consequences of bad lives choose quiet, retiring lives that hide from the world. Only a few wise individuals who have clarity regarding the nature and purpose of life can dispassionately choose lives that really matter, lives that will further their spiritual growth and be of help to others. Upon choosing, all souls are compelled to cross the dry, dusty plain of Lethe, forgetfulness, and drink from the waters of the stream Amalete, oblivion, before being whisked into new births. Again, the less wise drink heavily, being very thirsty, and will remember none of this of their past lives. The very wise will take only a sip or two, and in the next life would be open to remembering a great deal. Plato has clearly set out a great doctor, the great doctrine of karma here, told as a story which is not to be taken literally as fact, but yet is full of theosophical wisdom. One might recall another story of lives like pearls being threaded on a golden thread in this regard. So a life worth living includes understanding death as a part of life. Knowing that karma is precise and entails reincarnation is crucial, but it is not the whole story. At present, we find ourselves in a world where nations cannot agree even on what the moment of death is. <coughs> Some link it to the stopping of the heart. Others to ceasing of brain activity is measured in one or another way. And, and yet, even with the cessation of brain activity, Sometimes the body can be artificially sustained for weeks, even months and years. Even the issue of cessation of brain activity is debated, 
Is it when the frontal cortex ceases to give off electrochemical signals? Or when the brain stem stops functioning? When is it appropriate to let go? And the flip side of this is a choice for euthanasia, exiting the body <coughs> before the body ceases to function, often to avoid excruciating pain, but increasingly because one has given up on life and meaning and purpose. One thinks of ancient Rome, where suicide was at times considered appropriate, an appropriate exit in the face of dishonor. One might also think of the return of Atlantis with the technology to prolong life indefinitely or cut it short medically. Thinking of life in light of death, Dr. Atul Gawande of Harvard University and a surgeon at a prominent hospital in Boston puts end of life issues in what may be a fresh perspective for many people. You may have to put up with just a little Help ad transform first. the conversation about aging in his book, Being Mortal, Medicine and What Matters in the End. His book was on the New York Times bestseller list for 85 weeks. It spent eight weeks at number one and is now available in paperback. Dr. Gawande is a professor at Harvard Medical School. He is also a surgeon at Brigham and Women's Hospital in Boston. Dr. Gawande, so good to see you. Glad to be here. Um, this, we were discussing this before the show. With everything else that's happening, no matter when this subject comes up, it always prompts a big discussion. Um, how do you think the conversation about end of life uh, has changed since this book came out? I think the big thing that's changed is that people are getting the idea that this isn't about death panels. This isn't about are you going to give up. This is about what are you fighting for? People turn out to have priorities in their life besides just living longer. We need to ask people what their priorities are, especially when they have a serious illness or frailty. If we don't ask, our care and what we do to people isn't aligned with what, they, what matters most to them, and then you get suffering. But when you do ask, it's extraordinary, and people are are just now they're starting to ask. Words matter like what? I mean, it really got me thinking about how I want to die, when I want to die, even though I have no say over it. You know, it, it made me think, what is the best way to end your life? And it's not, what way, what is the best way for life to end, rather? And you said it's not about the quality, it is more about the quality, not the quantity of the life. Yeah, here's the important thing. This book, um, it seems like be really scary, scary right? Yeah. Uh, uh, how do you have a good death? That is not the goal. The goal is not a good death. The, go the goal is a good life all the way to the very end. So and, what should we how. be asking? Yeah. yeah. What so ask? what you have to ask are things like, what's your understanding of where you are with your health? Uh, what are you willing to go through and what are you not willing to go through for the sake of more time? What's the minimum quality of life you'd find acceptable? What are your fears what, about what's ahead with your health? And people then say, I read about uh, a man who said, um, his answer was, well, if I can watch football on television and eat chocolate ice cream, that'll be good enough for me. Keep me going. And I'll but go if through I can't, anything to do that. I'll go through anything said, to do that. Yeah. If I can't, let me go. It's, it's the best living will ever. Mm -hmm. And then you start asking, well, would that be good enough for you, Gail? <laughs> would that be good enough for you, Jeff? Or mm -hmm. And the conversation starts. I like how you've reframed this debate and about how in medical school, the whole thing is about how to save lives, but we don't talk about the demise of life. How important is that not only from a financial perspective in terms of Medicare, but from a moral perspective? Yeah, I mean, I think w what definitely starts the conversation sometimes on a public stage is we spend a quarter of all Medicare dollars on the last year of life, most of it in the last couple of months. And it's often, the evidence is it's often increasing suffering rather than improving life. Mm -hmm. um, but the real moral question is getting to that focus on how do you want to live? What really matters to you? And we don't ask that question. I, I tell the story of a, a medical director in a nursing home who fought a battle to allow people to have pets in the nursing home. Yeah. There was a fight with the staff. There was a fight with the director. There was the fight with the regulators because they all say, well, it's not safe. But life is bigger than safety and survival. It, do I have love in my life, which the pets brought? Do I have mm. responsibility? Do I have something to care for? And so the people actually had lower drug use, and they lived longer. Well, you say most people want to fight till the bitter end, until they're told that where the doctors say there's nothing more we can do, which is really not a good way to look at it. That's how I've looked at it. Not a good way to look at it, because there's always something doctors can do, we can but always at what say cost? More. But right. at what cost? Yeah, and the, 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 the real question is not, do you fight or do you want to give up? 
what are you fighting for? My father, I tell the story, a surgeon had a brain tumor. And then when we asked, what are you really fighting for? For him, it wasn't chocolate ice cream and football on television. It was to be at the family dinner table with family and friends and be able to enjoy that experience at least some of the time. Yeah. And so then we could, we could guide around the fact that if he lost that, that's when just make sure he's not in pain. Here's a little Dr. nugget Gawain. for you to have children. Chances of avoiding a nursing home directly related to the number of children you have, especially if you have daughters. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Thank you, Dr. Gawande. Daughters take care. Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Gawande does not raise those deeper spiritual questions that we're likely to ask, at least for ourselves. But he shows where the end of life can make more sense for any, everyone than it does now. He notes that it is quality, not quantity of life that matters, and this is true at every level. So he puts the question, what are you continuing life for? Here theosophy can give answers, both in the most universal perspective and for any particular individual. In this conference, we need to consider relevant answers that can be meaningful and helpful to diverse peoples in various situations. So our topics are hot indeed, both as current issues generating intense discussions around the world and as challenges which apply to ourselves and to all human beings. We're reminded of the tripod in the inner sanctum at Delphi, where the oracle sat and delivered Apollo's mysterious and ambiguous oracles. For theosophy, the tripod is tapas whose three legs are study of theosophy, meditation, and self-study. One leg alone will not suffice, and any two will not let us mount the seat of the oracle, the center from which true insight comes. All three are necessary. How we engage in this triple work depends upon our karma, what is necessary for each individual, and what opportunities for the present each has generated in the past. Deep study of theosophy requires the reflective questioning that the Buddha taught. Accept nothing as a truth, not even Buddha's words, without testing them in one's own life. Some fortunate seekers have found theosophy, but that is hardly the end of the quest. Rather, it is the beginning. For once a seeker has found, the real seeking begins, for one now dives into the ocean of theosophy at ever greater depths, never reaching the bottom, because the ocean is bottomless. Study is not just to master complex and subtle doctrines, but to affect consciousness. Breaking up the mindset of the age, purging cultural assumptions, and unreflective beliefs and biases, so that we see ourselves and others more clearly within a large view consonant with the whole of manifestation. Pythagoras taught that before we sleep, we should review the day just lived to see what we did well, what erroneously or inadequately, and what we might have done better. Doing so takes courage. Because the ego, always taking everything for itself, itself if allowed to do so, sees this activity as beating oneself up. This, that can be disheartening, even depressing. But the point is not to denigrate oneself, not even the ego, which, after all, is an instrument for living in the world. The point is to engage in this self-study dispassionately in order to learn and for the sake of one's bodhisattvic growth. As we understand ourselves at ever more profound levels, we will understand others at those levels. And this strengthens our ability to be of genuine help to all. We can glimpse the Krishna within, and we can begin to glimpse the Krishna in one another, as the Gita advocates. So we need to meditate. If theosophical teachings are to become practical, Yet theosophy does not teach a system of meditation. Why? The theosophical teacher, Raghavan Iyer, explained that the meditator, and I quote, will conclude that by definition, there could not be any fixed technique of meditation upon the transcendent. 
Technique is a mechanistic term. A techne or skill has rules that can be reproduced. On the other hand, that which is transcendental cannot be reproduced. It does not manifest, and it is beyond everything that exists, so there can be no technique for meditating on it. Each human being is ultimately this transcendental reality. And so what we come to know within cannot be said, yet it affects everything we do in our relationship to others. The wisdom of the master becomes clear. Theosophy was presented to the world in its most unveiled form, though veil upon veil remains, to nurture those who would serve others, not merely so that individuals might learn complex doctrines and terminology and feel like elites above the fray. We might say that be true, to be true theosophists, we have to take ourselves less seriously and more seriously than our present culture suggests. To the degree that we practice these teachings in thought, word, and deed, we will be able to do what Plato demonstrated in the Socratic Dialogues, engaging one another as spiritual beings, learning and teaching together in dialogue. This conference affords us the chance to do just this, and we can do this with anyone we encounter <coughs> who has a minimally open and questioning mind, beginning with where they are spiritually, mentally, and morally. We most likely will not know the results of these encounters, but under karma, we can hope that at some time in the future, our encounters may bear fruit. As Krishna advises, we act and let go the fruits of action. Being able to work at transforming ourselves for the sake of helping others, and to see all beings as souls with a <coughs> destiny as vast as cosmic evolution is the underlying challenge. In taking up that challenge in life, including the hot topics before us, as opportunities for bodhisattvic service, we begin to live a life that is indeed a life worth living. Our light may be small or large, but it will shine in the darkness of samsara and cast its illumination on us all. In closing, one can do no better than recall the words of HPB from her five messages. She said, <clears throat> men cannot all be occultists, but they can all be, to, all be theosophists. Many who have never heard of the society are theosophists without knowing it themselves. For the essence of theosophy is the perfect harmonizing of the divine with the human in man, the adjustment of his godlike qualities and aspirations, and their sway over the terrestrial or animal passions in him. Kindness, absence of every ill feeling or selfishness, charity, goodwill to all beings, and perfect justice to others as to oneself are its chief features. He who teaches theosophy preaches the gospel of goodwill, and the converse of this is also true. He who preaches the gospel of goodwill teaches theosophy. Thank you, Irwin, for your help. Thank you, Jim, for your wonderful introduction.